welcome. Um, we will go ahead and get started. My name is Sierra Bragan, and I am the owner and founder of Miami Mom Collective. And Miami Mom Collective is Miami's premier parenting resource. We exist to encourage, equip, and empower local moms. And we do that through content and resources made just for you, as well as events. So we host Moms Night Out events, and we host events for families as well. So if we can ever be a resource to you, you can find us on all of the social platforms at Miami Mom Collective. Well, I have to tell you, like I mentioned before I introduce um, Dr. Audrey Ophir, who has been with us many times before, she is, um, I guess you'd say a, a hometown crowd around here. So we love having her with us, excited to have her back. I do want to take a couple minutes before we get started to remind you all, um, if you're not familiar with You Health Jackson Children's Care, especially all of you mamas and daddies and nannies of little bitty babies, any, any age, but especially those little ones when it's just nerve wracking and you never know if you might need an ER, I want you to know that the pediatric emergency rooms at Holtz Children's Hospital and Jackson North are available to you 24 seven. Holtz actually offers a 24 hour kids only emergency room. So that's a great plus right now, especially with COVID still going on to know you could just go somewhere where there will be only children there. Um, so if you are visiting these locations, you can know and rest assured that you as well as your children are gonna get access to every pediatric subspecialist at Holtz Children's Hospital from the University of Miami Health System and the Jackson Health System. So just a plethora of the very best resources. All of the, um, the ERs are staffed with board certified pediatric emergency medicine specialists. So this is great news for you um, and they're always there and available. So please just take note of that. I hope you never need an ER, but if you do, please know that at Holtz Children's, the doctors and the nurses are all certified in pediatric advanced life support. So you're gonna get the best care possible. So make note of that, but without further ado, Dr. Ophir, welcome back. We are so Thank glad you. that you are here. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here today. Oh, we're so excited. I want to tell you, um, all of you listening, a little bit about Dr. Ophir. She's the Associate Professor of Pediatrics and the Director of the Pediatric Comprehensive Care Clinic at the Holtz Children's Hospital at U Health Jackson Children's Care. She is a faculty member, so she's teaching both University of Miami medical students as well as the Jackson Health System physicians who are training at all levels, and particularly in the area of outpatient primary care. So she's delivered many lectures on the subject, including um, immunizations, newborns, and their first visits, and her expertise centers around the medical home model, which she's been practicing for more more than 15 years and most of her patients are medically complex children including those who have um, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, Vader syndrome, autism, sickle cell disease, leukemia, and transplant patients. So Dr. Ophir, I know you are a wealth of information because every time you're on, I'm my wheels are always turning with so many questions for you. So thank you, thank you for joining mm -hmm. us tonight. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be here. I really enjoy it. Oh, it's so good. Um, so those of you who are watching, I want to tell you that in that chat box, um, when you comment there, everyone can see your comments and you can, um, you know, put things there. But if you have questions, would you please put your questions in the Q&A box and we will do our very best to get to all of those um, as we can. We have lots of questions already that we're going to work through. But if if something tracks your mind during the time, you can drop it there and we're going to do our best to keep it right here around one hour. So let's dive in. Baby noises is our topic today. Um, I have three children. My youngest is four months. So we're still in like all those, you know, baby noises phase and the exciting noises now of laughing and, and babbling and cooing. But I know those, those first, you know, few weeks, especially your babies can make noises that just really scare you. So we're going to dive into that. Um, but tell us, Dr. Ophir, how do baby noises differ by age and what are normal sounds for like a one week old versus a three month, six month old? Right, so really it all depends uh, on the development. Uh, let's face it, a one week old developmentally doesn't do much, right? Uh, right? So it's not until about two months old that they start cooing that we have to wait until four months old for them to be babbling. And just to clarify the difference, uh, the cooing is mostly vowels. Uh, the babbling is mostly consonants. 
Um, and then around the age of six months old, they will actually start to recognize the sound and they will recognize when you call their name. So uh, they are at different milestones. And I know that at the end of the talk, we're gonna have the website for the Bright Futures. I strongly encourage every parent to look it up um, because actually it is made for parents and it tells you a lot about the development uh, and the expectations that you can have uh, for your children. Uh, and it's a kind of a stage by stage, uh, age by age kind of milestone. So it's really useful. That's a great resource. Um, man, I got to be honest, my four year old just <laughs> it's a good thing this is um child friendly right absolutely, um, just, absolutely. Okay, okay, you need to go to daddy now yes ma'am <laughs> yes ma'am <laughs> that's All great right. babies cry a lot so talk to us about decoding our baby's cries so that's a really good question because you know before the the children are able to speak to us Crying is there a way to communicate with us? So it's really important for us, for the parents, especially the new parents, uh, to know and decipher uh, what the crying is all about. Uh, so for example, is it because they're hungry? Is it because the newborn is hungry? Um, we have what we call hunger cues. So for example, when the baby is putting their fist in their mouth, when they're sucking on their hand, or uh, they're uh, maybe, maybe turning their head to the side and kind of extending the corner of their mouth, all of those are hunger cues. Uh, so when you see that, definitely go ahead and start feeding your baby. Um, and then there's the baby with a sole diaper. Uh, so nowadays, I have to say, uh, you know, I call it the magic line. Uh, my kids definitely didn't have that on their diaper. Right. Uh, but, you know, there is, of course, a way, an easy way from the outside to know whether uh, the diaper is wet. Uh, it's a safe bet. You know, if the baby is crying and is not hungry, then check the diaper. Make sure that the diaper is not wet. Uh, you may want to know, you know, maybe the baby is just, you know, wanting your attention or something like that. It's easy. Just respond and see if the baby is comforted and that's good enough. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, to make the distinction between those normal cries, if you will, uh, and a baby who is sick, uh, you know your baby best. And mm -hmm. if your baby is not easily comforted, com comforted, then really that's the sign that there's something else going on. Uh, so I usually kind of distinguish between a cranky baby, uh, a cranky baby that's maybe hungry, that maybe has a soul diaper, and an irritable baby. An irritable baby mm -hmm. will not be easily comforted. And if mm -hmm. that's the case, then you probably do want to seek um, medical help to be able, or at least a phone call to be able to find out if you should be doing something or going to uh, your pediatrician or the emergency room after hours. That's good. That's good. I love what you said. Yeah. No one knows your baby like you do. There's nothing Absolutely. worse than your mother-in-law saying I'm hungry. <laughs> and you're like, I just fed that baby. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Um, we did get a question though, a little, a little more into that. Um, once baby starts to discover their hands and they're gnawing on their hands, you know, all the time, is there any way to kind of help that decipher, you know, are they hungry or are they just kind of finding their, their hands. Yes, no, it is a hunger cue. So you should go ahead and, and assume that it, they're probably hungry. Remember that usually, not that all the babies are by the book, but usually the teething is not until five to seven months old. Um, oh, very, right. very often I get parents who tell me that their babies um, are early and that they are teething at four months old. That's because they're drooling, but really it's not because of the teething. It's because they don't have a good coordination and control of their saliva. So yes, they are mm -hmm. drooling, but in fact, they're not yet teething. Uh, that's a little bit later on. So no, they don't have that conscious coordination or of, oh, you know what? I'm teething, it's hurting, and I'm putting my mouth in it. At that age, you know, at whatever, three right. months old, four months old, they don't have that developmental stage, that milestone. Uh, so no, um, I would assume that it's probably a hunger cue and you can go ahead and feed the baby. That's great. That's great. Should parents always run to baby's aid when they start crying? So, you know, I, I would probably kind of try to clarify what is it, a, you know, the aid, right. what you mean by the aid, you know. I think that certainly you should verify, um, you know, what is wrong with the baby or that there's nothing wrong with the baby. So whether by camera or going into the room, you want to go ahead and make sure, you know, did the baby vomit maybe? Is there something in the crib that is bothering the baby? Uh, you want to make sure that the baby doesn't have a fever, perhaps, uh, you know, you can certainly pick up the baby, make sure, you know, maybe comfort the baby a little bit, put back the baby uh, and check the baby out. 
so if the, the, the question is, can I go ahead and check my baby and comfort my baby? Absolutely. There's no rule against sure. that. Yeah. Right. Great. Um, okay. Give us some tips on how parents can help soothe the crying baby. Cause we've all had or have at times a crying baby. And what would be your tips for soothing? So there's many ways, very frankly. Uh, I mean, you can go ahead and, um, hold the baby in your, in your arms and rock the baby. You can rock them when they're into their chair. You can go ahead and use a pacifier. You can use a soft music. You can use nowadays, you have the white noise uh, machines. Uh, you can go ahead and, and use any of that in the stroller. You can go ahead and kind of uh, walk with them in the stroller. As long as it's a safe uh, way, any of that, try it out. Whatever works for your baby is absolutely fine. That's great. That's great. We're getting lots of questions. People are very excited and interested in this topic, obviously. Um, one question says she has a six week old and she says the baby continues to put hands in the mouth even after a full bottle feed. Do you feed more or do you wait two to three hours? What would be your advice there? Six week old. So is this a bottle fed or, or a nurse? A bottle fed. That's what she yeah. says after a full bottle. Right. So uh, probably uh, you can go ahead and, and try to feed the baby uh, still. Um, obviously, this is a question that you want to go ahead and discuss further with your pediatrician because it all depends. Uh, you know, not every baby is alike. Is this a full term? Uh, you know, how many uh, kilograms does the baby weigh? You want uh, the baby to gain uh, a certain amount of grams per day and so on and so forth. You know, at six weeks, you want them to have about 30 grams a day and so on and so forth. So it's always best to go ahead and kind of uh, get your particular case discussed with uh, your pediatrician. Uh, but usually it is a hunger cue. So is it because the amount that you're giving is not enough? Maybe your baby needs more right now. Maybe because they're sleeping too long, uh, you know, at nighttime and the total amount of calorie in the 24 hours is not satisfying enough. Uh, you know, for me as a provider, that's probably the kind of question I would go into to be able to find out why is this baby still hungry? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, great. Good tips. My, my mind is, is spinning because I'm just, I'm reliving all my babies at that age <laughs> and the cluster feeds where you think, how can you eat again? You know, mm -hmm. just, oh. It um, becomes a blur after a while. That's, that's for sure. Right. We all make it through and then it's, it's a blur. That's right. Um, okay. Talk to us. One question says they've noticed that their newborn cries a lot and seems to be in pain after eating. Could it be colic or should they change the formula? So that's a very good question, um, because we have a lot of parents who come to the visit and say, you know, my baby is colicky. Colic, by definition, really should be a significant crying prolonged of many hours, uh, starting usually at the early evening hour and again, prolonging itself for a couple of hours. Uh, it actually usually resolves by itself around the age of six months old. Um, we okay. still don't know the exact mechanism of colic. Um, so some people believe that it has to do with gas. Uh, but very frankly, here again is the story of the chicken of the egg, which one came first. Uh, because when you think about it, uh, when they cry, they swallow a lot of air and the air is gas. So, you know, is it because they cried a lot that they have a lot of gas or is the colicky baby first gassy and, uh, you know, in discomfort and then cries, you know, who knows? Uh, right. Then there are some people who believe that uh, they're milk formula intolerant, but really there hasn't been any good large study that have been able to associate the two. So changing the formula, very frankly, although a lot of people do it, is pretty much a moot point. Usually when there's a true uh, milk protein intolerance, you usually will have another symptoms uh, as well. So diarrhea or rash, but not just crying, very frankly. Um, and again, it usually resolves by itself uh, by the age of six month old. Uh, now, what can we do, you know, for a baby who's colicky? I never underestimate when a parent comes and tells me, you know, I don't know what to do. My baby is colicky because it is really overwhelming. Uh, it is very draining for a parent to have, you know, this baby who is crying. Uh, they don't know what to do. They feel helpless. Uh, and, uh, you know, it goes on and on every night. Uh, yeah. So a few tips, perhaps you can go ahead and try burping to uh, kind of help and evacuate that air. You can try uh, because we know that when they bottle feed, uh, they swallow more air than nursing 
By the way, this is one more incentive to breastfeed uh, rather than bottle feed. So uh, you can try to perhaps if you're going to bottle feed, uh, then you want to go ahead and choose maybe those bottles that are either curved or they have a plastic lining inside. Uh, so those have a tendency to uh, have the baby swallow less air when they're feeding. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, again, try any safe way to comfort your baby when they're crying. So again, rock them, uh, sing to them, um, you know, in their stroller. Uh, some parents will tell me, you know what, I, I give them a ride in my car around the neighborhood and it helps. Whatever safe way that works for you, baby, is okay. Um, but again, usually it will resolve around the age or by the age of six months old. That's great. Okay, six months. We can do anything for six months, <laughs> ladies. <laughs> I took many a car rides with one of mine. I remember those days. Um, okay, lots of great questions coming in. This is amazing. I feel like I'm sitting in my pediatrician visit, you know, but it's like a gold mine of all the things that I've ever wanted to ask. Um, so one mom is asking that her baby is three weeks old, cries all the time when she puts her down, the baby down in the crib. Is there any way that she could help the baby, you know, make that transition better sleeping in her own space? Um, well, as you know, uh, we highly recommend safe sleep. Uh, so it is important for each and every baby to sleep in their crib alone, nothing in the crib, on their back. Uh, and it's, you know, on a, on a firm mattress uh, with, like I said, no, no stuffed animals or anything like that. Uh, so now if you want to put the baby to fall asleep on you and then transfer them, you know, that's okay. Uh, but we do not recommend, the American Academy of Pediatric does not recommend uh, really the, the uh, baby sleeping anywhere but uh, in their crib. Um, I personally do favor the pacifier as a comfort measure just because um, the baby does need some soothing and some comfort. Uh, and if we don't, I mean, my first one didn't have the pacifier and ended up with a finger in the mouth and that's so much harder to get rid of. Uh, so if you choose uh, a pacifier that is adequate for a baby that age, uh, that's one more uh, thing that you can do to be able to comfort them. Uh, but I would recommend it's okay if you want to comfort and put the baby to sleep on you. Uh, but then once they're asleep, just go ahead and put them on their back to sleep in the crib. That's right. That's good. And remind us while you're talking about safe sleep, I always hear back is best. And, and how long is back best? Well, you know, the back to sleep is safe uh, as a precaution against a sudden infant death syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, and that unfortunately can happen up to 12 months old. Now, as the baby grows and gets older, obviously, statistically, the risk is lower, uh, but really it's up to 12 months old. Now, Developmentally, uh, the baby four month old and of course, definitely by six and all of that will roll around. Uh, so, you know, it's very difficult to keep them on their back, but uh, as much as you can, when you put them to sleep, you wanna go ahead and put them on their back. Uh, but the CIS, the sudden infant death syndrome, uh, statistically can happen up to that age, up to uh, one year old. Wow, okay, I hadn't heard that. Um, thank you, I know it was a little bit off topic. So baby yeah. noises, back to baby noises, lots of questions about burping and spitting and all that. So let's talk about, and this has happened to me, my littlest one, he, there would be times when I would like, okay, got my one burp, got my one burp, I knew we were good, but sometimes I'm like, where's that burp? He just doesn't want to burp. Is there, is something wrong? Like how important is burping? Right, that's, that's a good question because sometimes I have a parent who comes in and, and they really feel guilty or frustrated, I guess is a better word because they're trying to burp their baby and, and the baby doesn't want to burp. You know, when we think about it, burping is all about evacuating, uh, you know, the extra air. Uh, so you can go ahead and try. And usually we recommend, just as you mentioned, you know, if they're uh, breastfed in between the two breasts to go ahead and try the burping. If they're formula fed or bottle fed, um, probably about every two ounces, you want to go ahead and, and burp them every two to three ounces. Uh, but some babies just don't do it. They just don't burp. And that's okay. I mean, it's nothing that you're doing that is wrong. It's nothing wrong with your baby. Um, it is what it is. It's not, they're not sick. Nothing will happen to them. They just don't burp. Uh, so it's okay. I just reassure the parent if that happens. Okay. That's good. Wonderful. What about a uh, two month old baby spits up, even sometimes vomits after eating? Should, should you be worried? Um, so that's another good question. Uh, you know, spitting up is quite common at that age. Uh, and fortunately, most of the time it's very benign. 
Uh, it's very unlikely as long as there's no other symptoms uh, and that your baby is otherwise acting well, uh, that it is an obstruction or something that is so serious that uh, you, know, you have to bring your, your baby to the emergency right away. Uh, so most of the time it's either maybe some overfeeding uh, we have to remember that the baby's stomach is the size of their fist and their fist at that age is very small. Yeah. Uh, so we have a tendency maybe to overfeed them and whatever is over that limit will overflow. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they spit it up. Uh, but the other thing that is quite common at that age is something called reflux. Um, and what happens is the connection between the stomach and the feeding tube, which is the esophagus, is kind of lax at that age. So it allows the milk to kind of come back up after the feeding. Uh, mm -hmm. And also the esophagus, the feeding tube is very short at that age. So right. the combination of those factors allows for the reflux to be quite common uh, at that age. Uh, do we have to do anything about reflux? Not particularly, actually. Uh, the pediatricians usually will look out for if the baby is not gaining weight, then it is a criteria for us to do something about the reflux. Uh, if the baby is in discomfort, uh, if they're arching back from pain uh, from the reflux because it's irritating their esophagus, uh, if from the acid of the reflux, it's irritating the lungs and ca causing some respiratory uh, symptoms, then yes, we want to go ahead and put this baby on medication. But otherwise, not really, because again, with time, uh, it will go away because that muscle around the connection of the stomach and the feeding tube will actually strengthen and the esophagus will lengthen. So by right. itself, the reflux will go away. So we usually do not have really to do much about that reflux. Sometimes uh, we may recommend for uh, the parents to do reflux precaution, first of all, that's very easy. So we ask them to burp and to kind of leave the baby uh, in uh, the uh, upright position for about uh, 30 to 45 minutes after the feeding. Um, and then the other thing that we could recommend is thickening the feeds. Uh, so thickening the feeds, we can add cereal with the permission of your provider, uh, adding uh, cereal to the formula uh, and the recipe that I usually use is one teaspoon of cereal to one ounce of formula. I personally do not recommend uh, rice cereal because rice cereal is constipating. So if you're going to use it that often, you may end up with an extra problem uh, yeah. to the initial one. So I usually use either oatmeal or barley instead of the rice. Uh, the other thing that you have to make sure also to tell the parent is that um, because the, the, the uh, formula ends up being thick, you want to make sure to change your nipple uh, and you want to make it to a nipple with a, a larger hole because otherwise you're going to end up with a baby very frustrated trying to suck on that milk and it's not coming out because it's thicker. So that's something uh, that's very important to remember. Good thought. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Um, okay, on the long, along the lines of reflux, people are asking what are like the common cues or symptoms that reflux may be an issue? I know you said arching back. Were there other things to watch for? So it's really plain spitting up or vomiting. That is actually reflux. The arching back is really what we call esophagitis. So it's the irritation of the feeding tube, which is really one of the complication of the reflux. It's not really reflux itself. It's one of the complication. But the reflux itself is actually simply vomiting. Um, so that, and then the, by the same token, uh, the baby can have a chronic nasal congestion or sometimes coughing and sometimes uh, some wheezing even, which is the, the respiratory complication of the reflux. But reflux itself is really spitting up or vomiting. So spitting and vomiting. Okay, okay. This is so helpful. Um, so many questions. We've got a few on this topic, but let's start with this one. My this, this question says, my newborn strains a lot and makes strained faces and noises when pooping. Does that mean the baby is constipated? What could you know help a baby who is constipated? Excellent question. We get that so very often. Uh, some parents actually even go to the emergency room in the middle of the night for it. Uh, so I'm really glad that we're uh, actually talking about that. Um, you can go on YouTube and actually put baby and straining or baby constipated. And some parents will put up the, those video of those babies making grimaces and, and they look so much in pain. Uh, it's really painful just to watch, uh, but it's important to clarify. Those straining uh, noises and those straining grimaces at that age in, in a newborn is absolutely normal. Um, you know, what I like to explain to the parents, imagine if we had to pass a bowel movement laying down, 
we would make the same noises, right? right. I mean, you have to kind of strain and get it out, right? So the right. same way. Uh, no, it, it is absolutely normal for them to make those training noises. Um, we don't really care. And when I say we, I mean the provider. We don't really care about uh, the straining noises. We're not going to call that constipation. We okay. don't really care about the frequency. So some babies will actually have a bowel movement after every feed and others will have twice a week. And that's okay. You know, as long as, and that's why I'm going back to, you know, your baby best, whatever the baseline is, we're interested at, is this different from their baseline, right? And then the color, well, the color varies. It can be green or yellowish or oranges or, um, you know, brown or, or, or something like that. There are only three colors that we worry about. If it is okay. black because it could be digested blood, is it red because it could be fresh blood, or is it mm -hmm. white, chalky white, because it could be a problem with their liver. But otherwise, okay. any other color, we're okay with usually. Um, and then the other thing uh, usually is the smell. So I have some parents who come to the clinic and they tell me, you know, yesterday the poop was really smelling bad. And then you look at them and you know, I don't think it's supposed to smell good, you know? So um, yeah, we don't really worry too much about the smell. Really yeah. the only thing that we consider when we're going to put the label of constipation is the consistency of the stool. So I'm sure that uh, parents have noticed that in the first couple of months, until we start the solid feeding, which is really more towards a six month visit, they have right. liquidy stools. And that's quite normal because they're only drinking. So yeah. their stool should be really kind of liquidy with what I call bird seeds in it. Right. Uh, right. And if, if it's not that, and if they have what I call dry pellets, right. then that's constipation. Okay. So okay. really that is the only criteria or definition for constipation at that age is okay. if they have stool consistency that is dry hard balls, that is really dry pellets, that is constipation. And so what do we do for it? Um, obviously we're very conservative with medication at that age group. Uh, we try not to use that initially. Uh, I personally will go with either prune juice or a carrot syrup. So prune juice, I will use uh, a one uh, ounce per day, uh, 30 mm -hmm. milliliters per day, but a lot of the babies are not used to the flavor. So I usually give an alternative uh, and right. it's very simple. It's the carrot syrup, the K-A-R-O, which is mild supex, and you find it right. in any grocery store uh, where the pancake syrups are. Um, and the mechanism by which it uh, works is very simple because it is so sweet it kind of sucks extra water into the intestine and that's how you get a little bit more liquidy stool. Uh, and the recipe that I use is one teaspoon up to three times a day. So what I mean by that is you start with one teaspoon, you can mix it into the milk of the formula. Uh, if that's good enough to give you the proper consistency of stool, you're fine. If not, you increase to twice a day and if not maximum three times a day. And of course, you always want to make sure that it's okay by discussing this with your provider. Nutrition, yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Okay, lots of more questions about the noises. Let's talk about babies at night. Um, you know, sometimes we we can a newborn baby can sometimes hold their breath or not breathe regularly, and that can really freak us out. So, yes. is that normal? And when should we worry? Very good. Yes. You know, babies are so different. You know, I always say. First of all, they're a miracle to begin with, but it takes them time to be able to have all their organs and their system maturing. It just doesn't happen just like that at birth. And so breathing is such a thing. Uh, and there is what we call periodic breathing uh, of the newborn. And so what happens is I usually try to demonstrate it to the parent or I tell them, you know, bring me a video of what you're worried about because nowadays, uh, you know, parents very often have smartphone. And so what happens is it usually happens uh, when they're sleeping during the active phase of sleeping, the REM sleep. And so right. what happens is they usually kind of hold their, uh, they, they hold their breath for let's say five seconds. And then they kind of, you know, breathe fast for just there a little go. bit. And then they go back to their regular breathing. So it's kind of a, I'm holding my breath and like this, and then like this, and they go back to the right. regular breathing. And when I imitate it to the parents, I go, yeah, just like that, they do that. It's okay, you know, as long as your baby is fine with everything else, you know, uh, we are active, we're eating the regular way, uh, you know, then it's fine. There's nothing to worry about. 
Okay. That's great. Yeah. Whew, I remember those days. The first one you think, Oh, you got, you don't, you don't sleep. Cause you just want to watch them. Exactly. Um, so you're putting everyone's heart at ease. Uh, okay. We have one question and this mom has a five month old and she says her five month old has recently started making a strider sound when she's breathing or babbling and she's perfectly fine and giggling, but the strider sound is unsettling for the mom. And she wants to know, is that normal? When will that end? So whenever a parent comes and actually puts a label on the sound, I ask them to demonstrate or again, show me a video uh, because sometimes what they call strider is not necessarily what we call strider. Uh, and a strider is usually kind of a, a whistle, a, you know, something like this. Um, right. And if this is what we're talking about, uh, then I would uh, um, encourage this parent to go ahead and seek actually uh, the medical help from their pediatrician. Uh, so I would maybe if uh, that parent could record uh, the strider on their smartphone and then go ahead and go into uh, their pediatrician to be able to um, uh, to get an evaluation. Um, and, you know, it could be something like an, a little narrowing over in the upper airway could could be different things. But I think that it warrants an evaluation from the pediatrician. Great. That's great. Yeah. As always run everything by your provider. This is great. Uh, circling back to like some of the tummy issues and grunting. This mom says she has um, an 11 week baby boy and he's had a sensitive tummy, which she sees is getting better as the weeks pass by. Like you mentioned, everything's growing and changing. However, she noticed that while he's nursing, he sometimes squirms and grunts and even gives a little scream and then he'll pass gas or he'll dirty his diaper. Is it normal or is it an indication of discomfort? She's like, you know, this mom says, I just feel bad for him, but can that be normal? And he's 16 pounds. So he's eating fine <laughs> and he's breastfed. Um, and she's removed dairy from her diet, you know, trying to help. And he's taking a probiotic, but she wants to know, is that normal or? Well, actually you, you hit a, a very important spot. If the baby is gaining weight, you can go ahead and breathe. You can be reassured uh, okay. that it's probably nothing significant. And and again, at this age group, they will make a lot of noises. I always encourage the parent, go ahead and videotape what you're talking about. It is so helpful to us, you know? So go ahead and tape it. And that's all it takes. You know, you just show it to your pediatrician, you know, is this okay or not? But at this age group, they do a lot of grunting and, you know, and noises and all of that. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're in pain, by the way. They have a very immature neurological system. And so they make a lot of, you know, you have to remember that they're, you know, very protected inside of our womb in liquid. So they don't hear necessarily all of these noises. And then all of a sudden, one day, whoop, you know, they're out. So they're reacting to a lot of what's going on, you know, out there. And it doesn't mean necessarily that they're in pain. Uh, but again, uh, you can go ahead and seek uh, the, the evaluation from your pediatrician, but videotape that sound, you know, or, or record that sound uh, just to make sure that um, because sometimes the baby or more often than not, the baby doesn't do it right there, you know, at the pediatrician's office. So just to make sure to reassure yourself 100%. That's great. Thank you for that good advice for her. Um, okay, wonderful. Let's talk now about newborn sneezes, stuffy noses. Should you be concerned, you know, that they are, are showing these? these so signs? I'm so glad that you're asking that question, Sierra. So I can tell you that this is probably the number one reason why parents and especially new parents will bring their newborn to the emergency room or to the pediatrician's office as walk-in because they're worried. They hear, you know, their baby with this nasal congestion or sneezing right. a lot. Uh, and, you know, they're afraid. My baby has a cold. What should I do, right? Because, and rightly so, they don't want to give any medication from over the counter because they're so small. Uh, so it's really important to talk about what is normal, when should I worry, right? Uh, when my baby has uh, these nasal secretion. So first and foremost, it is absolutely normal to get nasal secretion on a daily basis, right? But the big difference with babies and newborns is that their nose is comparatively to ours, very, very small, right? So a little bit of secretion in that nasal passageway will make a very big difference in a newborn. Right. Not only that, but they are nose breather, not like us, they're mouth breather. So when they have all these uh, secretion in their nose and they're breathing through their nose, of course, it's noisy breathing that you end up with, right? right. So right. how can we help them out? Because we as adults, we take a Kleenex, we blow our nose and it's gone, right? But they cannot do that. So we have That's to right. help them out a little bit. 
Uh, I personally love the nasal saline. Uh, it's over the counter. It's only salt and water. But what it does, it helps to irrigate and thin out those secretions. Mm -hmm, the trick mm -hmm. is, however, uh, and I usually demonstrate that to the parent uh, because they're very gentle with their baby usually. And so they kind of put one or two drops in the nose. Yeah. <laughs> that is not going to have any effect whatsoever. There's right. nothing in there. It's salt and water. So you have to really squeeze it, give it a big squirt to have uh -huh. the irrigation effect. So what I usually demonstrate to the parent is I show them to put the baby on the, laying down on their back on the exam table to take that bottle, shake it very well, and then uh -huh. to turn the head of the baby to one side and then to go ahead and put the bottle uh, in on the same side as the head turn. Uh, so let's say to the right. right. Closest, to the, closest to the table, right? Exactly. And okay. to go ahead and put that bottle uh, inside the nose and to give it a very big squirt, really big squirt. So it's kind of, you know, the baby's going to get a little startled, but that's it. They forget it a lot quicker than us. Uh, and you don't have to do anything else. You give them a little bit of a breather and then you do the same exact thing on the other side. And then what I ask them to do is to take the baby on their shoulder upright. And then with gravity and gravity alone, very frankly, very often that starts to come out or they will sneeze it out or they will cough it out or they will swallow it. It doesn't really matter or nothing at all, but it really helps to irrigate and thin out those secretions. Uh, and very often, actually, when I uh, demonstrate that in the clinic, the noisy breathing is already better. And they go, oh my gosh, it's already better. It's gone. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I usually combine that with two other things. I usually ask the parent to have a humidifier in the room because okay. that moisture really helps with the congestion uh, or the stuffiness. And then if they're really, really congested, but especially if they have a little bit of a cough, not a bad cough, a little bit of a cough, shower steam really works. We used to use it a long time ago, and especially in the hospital with uh, the bronchiolitis uh, kids, we used to put them inside a tent with steam. So I usually tell my parents, well, go into the bathroom, close the door, let the hot water run, and then sit with your baby, not under the hot water, obviously, right. but let them breathe that steam, and it really helps out with all of that congestion. Um, mm -hmm. I personally do not use suction, and I just want to mention that briefly, because if you really suction too hard, you cause trauma inside the nose. Trauma equals inflammation, equals swelling, and we're back to square one. So personally, oh, okay. I just use the squirting, but I use it very uh, strongly, but I do not use suctioning. Great. What age is that safe to do when you're saying squirt it like that? I mean, is there a certain point Day you would one. say, it's hard to hear? Day one. So, Day one. There absolutely. You go. So okay. I usually will recommend to use it as a toilet, you know, uh, when you're going to go ahead and start their bath. So mind you, as long as they have their cord, you cannot use do the bath. So maybe, you know, a little bit later on. Uh, so you go ahead and, and make it part of their toilet. Uh, when they're a little bit more congested, you can increase it to three times, four times. It, it doesn't really matter. It's salt and water. Yeah, great. Okay, why did we, I never thought of this. I just and, thought, oh, poor baby. <laughs> and there's no capping of the age, by the way. Our ENT, yeah. ears, nose, and throat specialists love it. Uh, you can go ahead, it has different format, the teapot in the shower and all of that. You can use it in the adult as well. Okay, great. Look at this great advice, love it. Okay, circling back a little bit. I know we were talking about grunts at night with babies. What about grunts during the day, six month old? Is this an issue or is it, are they just exploring and learning their sounds? Grunting, it depends, very frankly. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that, very frankly, because you want to look at the whole picture. So again, you know okay. your baby best. Is the baby just grunting for a short period of time? Is the baby eating well? Is the baby not crying more than usual, not sleeping more than usual, uh, acting normally and playful and smiling? Then I'm okay. But if the grunting is actually meaning with respiratory difficulty, so the nose is going in and out, here at the neck base, over here it's going in and out, maybe the accessory muscles of the breathing, the baby is coughing, uh, then mm -mm, the actual grunting. So again, it depends what the parent is calling grunting, uh, right. you know, versus is it what I'm calling grunting. Uh, so the medical terminology of grunting is not normal. So it really all depends on uh, what we're calling grunting. Okay. okay, great. Yeah, pull out your phone, video your baby and yes. take it to your pediatrician. This is always a safe bet. 
Um, okay, we we're talking about the congestion. If the baby, this mom says her baby is a bit congested, even wheezing sometimes, but there's no constant cough. He has a little bit of reflux, 11 weeks old, should you be concerned? So remember what we mentioned about, <clears throat> if the reflux has a, compl a complication and wheezing A is one of those respiratory complications, then she should address it with a pediatrician, yes. Okay, great, great, wonderful. Um, okay, transitioning now to, uh, well, actually one more thing on the cold thing. If, if baby has a cold, you know, we're talking about the saline, is there, at what point should they see a doctor or, I mean, obviously no over-the-counter things when they're that little? Thank you for reminding me actually, because I should have mentioned that before. So how do we know it's just simple little nasal secretion, a little congestion versus actually an infection, right? And it's important to be able to tell the difference. So again, you know your baby best. So if the baby has any difference from baseline other than this nasal congestion. So if the baby has a fever, which by the way, is a temperature of 100.5 or more. If the baby is irritable, if the baby is not eating as well as usual, if the baby is sleeping too much, if the baby is not acting right, if the baby is not smiling uh, as usual, if the baby is coughing and that's interfering with sleeping or feeding, any or all of the above, then yes, we should go ahead and bring the baby uh, to be examined by a doctor, yes. Great, great. Thank you, Dr. Ophir, for clarifying on that. Okay, let's talk about hiccups. Um, our, my, I remember my baby's hiccuping in my belly, and it's just like the funnest little thing, right? But what about when they're on the other side? Are constant hiccups a sign of a bigger problem? Why are babies hiccuping so much, and what can we do to help? So talking about, remember what I said, uh, you know, their, their organs and systems are not all mature, you know, from the day of birth. So it has to do with their diaphragm. The diaphragm is that partition or section that differentiates the chest from the stomach and the abdomen and the intestine and all of that. And so their diaphragm is immature. And that's why babies hiccup a lot more often than the adults. Uh, now, do we have to do something about it? Not necessarily because it resolves on its own. However, it's true that it's very impressive to the parent because you have a little body that kind of, you know, kind of, you know, shuts up in, up in the air. So what is okay to do? Uh, you can certainly give them a little bit of milk if they are hungry. So either breast milk or formula. You can give them extra water. But by the way, this is the exception to the rule because you normally do not need to give extra water to your baby because they feed liquid already, which is their breast milk or their formula. Uh, but when, for the hiccup, you could give them a little bit of extra water, but never sweeten it and never, ever, ever uh, add honey or give honey to your baby less than 12 months old because they could get a very dangerous infection uh, called botulism. So right. don't sweeten the water and definitely do not ever give them honey. Very important. Yes, great. Um, one mom asked, are hiccups normal after every feeding in newborns? She she's breastfeeding. So it sounds like maybe her baby's hiccuping all the time. So is that could, something she should do in her future? It could. I mean, I always say, is the first thing that I look at, I look at the weight. If your baby is gaining weight otherwise, in spite of, sure. Great. I'm reassured and I'll try to reassure the parent. Love that. Love that. Um, okay. While we're talking about things that we should and shouldn't give our babies, honey, never, ever until they're after one. What about um, one, one parent is asking, can they give their one month old baby oatmeal with the formula? So, you know, it's important to remember that the babies really do not need anything but their milk. So other than the situation of reflux that we talked about earlier on, where we wanna to try to kind of keep the milk down. And so we thicken uh, the milk in some instances, they really do not need that extra calorie. Uh, it's important because nowadays, and especially during the pandemic, uh, we've seen so many more cases of obesity and everything, and those fat cells start early on. So you really should not have uh, to give uh, the, the cereal early on, uh, you know, it's, and not only that, what I usually tell the parents is the cereal is a solid food. It really should be started when we start the solid food, so closer to six month old and with a spoon, not in the bottle. 
So now I know a, a lot of people, and you were talking about mother-in-law and grandmothers, uh, they usually give the trick to the mothers and or to the parent. And they say, you know what? If you want your baby to sleep longer at night, just go ahead and put, you know, <laughs> more calories, so they're going to sleep longer. But really, by the book, it is not recommended. Great, great. Um, thank you for that. And one quick question that just came in about the hiccups and you talked about, you know, maybe a little bit of water, but at three months old, can you do it that young or do you need to wait yeah. until after they start doing solids? Oh, even before three months old. No, no, okay. no, no. You can't give extra water even before that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you for asking, answering all of our questions. Great questions, everyone. Um, just a few more. We're getting close here to the end, but so many great questions still to answer. Tell us at what age should babies start cooing and laughing? And are these important milestones or do they happen at different paces for different babies? Right. So again, they start cooing around two months old. Uh, they start babbling uh, more so around four months old. The actual laughter uh, is more like around three to five months old. Uh, so of course I'm talking about a full-term baby, not somebody who's premature, uh, but usually those are the milestone. And again, I want to refer to the bright future, which is a subsection of the American Academy of Pediatric website, which, uh, hopefully we'll have, I think at the end of this talk to refer to, it is a phenomenal resource. Uh, and I really strongly recommend to refer to it. It's, it's amazing. Uh, and it's a, a good way to do a little bit of homework. I always encourage my families to do some homework before they go to the doctor. Uh, we don't have a, a, a crystal ball. So prepare your little list of questions. And uh, I'm always very happy when I see my parents uh, coming with their questions. Uh, and so go ahead and, you That's know, great. is my baby really doing that? Because apparently, according to Bright Future, they're supposed to. And ask the question, sure. Right. Oh, that's great. Great. Oh, and when they start laughing, it's just they could they could never sleep. But if they'll laugh, you'll you'll forget yes. that you haven't slept in three months. That's true. <laughs> um, let's talk about bedtime. So we have a question that says, we put the baby down in his crib, he immediately starts to cry. And some people have told this mom, like, I should let him cry himself to sleep, but I don't want that baby to be spoiled. But it's also heartbreaking to see him cry. So how would you advise this mom in this sort of situation? It's a good question because, you know, a lot of the parents are afraid to spoil their babies. And, you know, it's actually the contrary. The first six months of life, you cannot spoil your baby. So go ahead, pick up that baby, uh, cuddle your baby, give them love, give them nurturing. You will bond with your child. They need that feeling of safety, actually. Uh, so it is quite okay. Uh, as long as you put them back once uh, they fall asleep. But it is absolutely okay. You want to go ahead and check, make sure they're okay. Go ahead and put them back to sleep, comfort them, uh, and then go ahead and put them back to sleep in, in bed. It is absolutely okay. You will not spoil them uh, during the first few months of light and even up to six months old. You, you're not going to spoil them, no. That's great. So green light. Awesome. Green light. All right. So sticking with the topic of baby noises, how about noises for babies? Are sound machines like, you know, white noise, ocean, all of that, are those recommended for a baby's room? Sure. It's fine. It's safe. First of all, it doesn't, there's no contraindication. Uh, my granddaughter had it uh, to go to sleep. Um, absolutely. It's okay. It's one of the ways to uh, give them comfort and kind of this soothing sound as they're falling asleep. Um, not a problem. They could be used. Absolutely. Great. Wonderful. Um, and on that topic earlier, we were speaking about safe sleep and, you know, we talked about having them in their space alone by themselves. Uh, one mom asked, is sleeping alone in the bassinet beside them? Okay. Yes, absolutely. As long as it's not, you know, in their bed, in their adult bed, if it's just that bassinet that's right next to the adult bed, yes, on the back right. with nothing in the bassinet. Perfect. Perfect. And what about, we've got um, a one month old sometimes sleeps a lot more than four hours. What's the maximum that maybe a baby at that age should be without eating? Maybe kind of nervous that they sleep too much. I'm sorry. How old again? One month. Oh, one month. Um, so that's a good question, but again, I'm going to refer them to their pediatrician. And the reason why is this, it really all depends uh, how much that baby is gaining weight. Uh, because it has to do with the total amount of calorie that this baby is getting uh, in the 24-hour period. So usually at, 
you know, it's not until about four months old that they start stretching a little bit more and maybe give you five hours of sleep, six hours of sleep, if they're feeding right. very well the rest of the time. But before that, it's unlikely uh, that they're going to be stretching too long. And they usually sleeping maybe three hours, maybe four hours, but not really more than that. But it really depends. I mean, I have some babies who are born very large. Uh, they're eating a lot during the day and they don't really need to wake up every three hours, you know, during the night. So it's a, it's really a case by case. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule. Uh, and best thing is really to ask the pediatrician. Uh, but usually one month old is about every three to four hours. Um, but okay. sometimes can be more. Okay. That's great. Yeah. I remember if you kind of get one of those little stretches, you're like, yay, yes. yay. <laughs> but then you're like, oh, is that okay? You don't, you don't know what to right. think. Um, wonderful. Well, yeah, always ask your pediatrician. This is great advice. Um, I think as we start to wrap up here, let's talk about, okay, does having a noisy baby, is there any correlation to whether or not he will begin talking sooner? Or is there a correlation there when they're baby? So it's an interesting question, but it really all depends by what you mean by noise, uh, Sierra. So if, if we're talking about my baby is babbling a lot, uh, you know, is that going to mean that uh, he or she is going to be an early talker? Uh, and right. that actually could be just because if the baby babbles or not, if you think about it, and if the parent is good at responding, and the responding is a stimulation. So it's actually a cycle. So a lot of babbling is a good sign. It's a good milestone. The parent or the caretaker will actually respond. And that in itself is going to be a stimulation. And that will be actually a progression to the, the next milestone. So there's a good possibility uh, that this baby will be an early talker. So I, I don't want to call it noise. But if it yeah. is babbling, it's something that the parent or the caretaker will be responding to and stimulating that baby even further, then absolutely, it could be that that baby is going to be reaching their milestone a little bit earlier. I, I really strongly, strongly uh, recommend and believe in stimulation and early stimulation. Uh, we're very lucky in, uh, in our clinic to have a Reach Out and Read program, which uh, we give uh, actually books to our uh, children, our babies starting actually at six months old. And, you know, there's not a, a cap or, or, or a minimum age to start talking to your baby because this is how they learn language. They learn by listening and later on by imitating. So talk and talk to your baby. You're in the street. I always say, you know, tell them, oh, here's the car and it's blue and it's red and you're eating beans and this and that uh, because this is how you stimulate language. Uh, in your child. So, um, but to answer more directly to your question, if your baby is cooing and babbling a lot uh, and producing this reaction in you where you're going to be uh, stimulating your baby even more, then yes, could have an earlier milestone. So please right. babble away. <laughs> That's great. I, as much as I babble now, I think I must have been an early babbler because I feel like I've been talking since day one, right? <laughs> um, wow. Well, our, our time is just about up. We still have a lot of great questions come in, coming in. Um, they're not all on the topic of baby noises. So I want to try to get a couple of them if we can. And if you want to you know, pass on some of them just because we can't get into all the topics tonight. But um, do you recommend swaddling babies? Oh, thank you for bringing that bomb. I'm so sorry that I didn't mention it. Absolutely. Uh, a thin cottony blanket is good enough. You know, none of those really heavy, very nice looking, but heavy, you know, kind of blanket. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you for mentioning it, uh, whoever that was. Yes, yeah, swaddling, absolutely. You can go ahead and, and use that as a comfort measure. I'm sorry that I uh, forgot to mention that. Absolutely. Oh, that's great. And then another one is, is a, this is like the lightning round, is the pack and play bassinet safe for newborn to sleep in for the first couple of months? You can use it. Absolutely. As long as there's nothing else in the pack and play, you could. Yes. Great. Great. Okay. Um, and then I don't know how much we want to get into this topic because this could be a whole webinar, but thoughts on not vaccinating your child. That is definitely a whole other webinar. The only thing I'm going to say to that is prevention is always better than treatment. Um, I trained a long time ago and I have seen children who died of diseases 
that we can prevent. I get goosebumps every single time I say that. Uh, so I always tell my families uh, that I will do to their children what I did, what I did to my children, which means I give them all the vaccines that were available. Uh, and I strongly recommend vaccination. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. The benefits that. outweigh the risks all the time. Great. It's great. Um, okay. Last one. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm going to ask you the question. See, um, but is grumbling in the womb a concern? I'm not sure what that. I'm not sure what you mean by grumbling. Yeah. I'm not sure either. So if there's any clarification, you can throw that back. <laughs> Sorry. <in. laughs> but um, Dr. Ophir, this has been amazing. So many awesome questions tonight. Super engaging. I do want to take a minute and remind everyone that if you want to share this with a friend or you want to go back and refer to it, listen again, these will all be available. They're being recorded. So it'll be available on jacksonevents.org. And you can go back and watch the recording, not only of this webinar, but of all of them. So I just want to take a minute again and thank you, Dr. Ophir, for joining us. These are some resources here that would be helpful for all of you. She mentioned these during um, our time together, especially the Bright Futures website right there. So you could take a screenshot of this and you'll have all of those resources or grab your smartphone and take a picture. Um, wonderful resources. Again, you Health Jackson Children's Care. Thank you so much for hosting. These webinars have been so important um, and so informative and helpful for us. So I want you to go ahead, everyone that's here and mark your calendars to join us again. So we will be, um, we'll be back in two weeks. It's April 22nd, Thursday again at 8 p.m. And the topic is going to be depression in children. So depression can affect anyone, including children as young as age three. I had no idea. Um, I have a four-year-old, a two-year-old and a, a baby. So I'm thinking, wow, this is, I had no idea it could affect children that young, but it often goes undiagnosed and untreated because the symptoms can be passed off as normal emotional or psychological changes and developments. So come and join us in two weeks and learn what depression looks like in children and what treatments are available. So join us again. That will be Thursday, April 22nd, again at 8 p.m. Um, as a reminder, all these are recorded. You can visit jacksonevents.org. And thank you all for joining us tonight, for participating. So many great questions. It's been a, a wonderful audience. And again, Dr. Ophir, we appreciate you and thank you so very much. Thank you so very much for having me again tonight. It's all